Hello everyone. I'd like to discuss briefly uh, your uh, topic posts for uh, Discussion Module 2, Karl Marx, uh, and uh, a couple of the readings, uh, the first two readings out of the four um, for this week uh, at least, um, and perhaps pick up uh, a, a little bit on the second two. Um, we talk, uh, Marx talks about alienation, okay? So what, what is it, this alienation, okay? I mean, I asked you um, to speculate a little bit, to get you thinking about this in your discussion. I asked you to uh, examine um, your own work history. You know, I mean, have you worked a job for someone else that you found to be terrible? Have you ever worked for yourself? Okay. Um, uh, indeed, uh, you know, there's a difference. There's a fundamental difference. If you're working for somebody else, uh, you're watching the clock a lot of times. When will this end? Or you're asked to uh, work uh, extra hard, you know, for no more money. Um, when you're working for yourself, though, I imagine, imagine that you had a job mowing lawns or selling uh, Avon products or something like that, you tend to work, uh, people who have these small entrepreneurial jobs, it's interesting, they tend to work much harder. They're not really watching the clock, they're working as hard as they can. Uh, one example I can think of of people who own their own means of production are realtors. The people I know who are realtors work all the time with no uh, nothing else other than the, the, the final product and then because they reap the benefits of all of their work. Um, whenever we're forced to sell our labor to someone else uh, for less than its full value, alienation occurs. This is a definition of alienation. Marx calls it estrangement or alienation. That's a larger sense of the word alienation than just being, oh, I'm, I'm alienated, that's alienating, that makes me feel bad. Uh, that's an everyday use of the word. Uh, this alienation has a more specific sense that you need to, uh, you need to examine as you read through here, particularly through uh, the philosophical manuscripts of 1844 um, uh, will give you uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Your second reading will give you a good grounding for this, these discussion posts. Um, uh, there's some central ideas that I wanted to cover in the first couple of readings that will help you uh, to guide you a little bit. Um, first, German ideology. The core idea is that ideas and human interest have no existence independent of physical reality. Uh, the way that humans have to organize themselves to meet physical needs is the cause. Ideas, religion, philosophy, norms, all our social and other social institutional arrangements, laws, our legal system, our educational system, uh, culture, what we look at for entertainment, are the effect. If you want to use a methods way of thinking about it, um, the economy is the independent variable in every case, in a very general way, in Marx. Uh, everything else, sort of the de dependent variable, whether it's the exper individual's experience of alienation or whether it's the way other large-scale uh, institutional arrangements in society are organized, these are all dependent or contingent on economic arrangements. Um, uh, you know, the, the, these, these change over time. Marx gives you examples over time of different ways in which uh, the economic arrangements, the, and by the economy, it's often also called materialism. Materialism in this sense does not mean, oh, you're so materialistic, you're greedy, you like a lot of bling, you like a lot of uh, accoutrements, you know, you say somebody's materialist or they want a bunch of stuff. That's not the sense of the word materialist that we're talking about here. 
when we're talking about materialism in terms of Marx and uh, general any German ideology in particular, materialism is the way that humans have to organize themselves to meet physical needs. Marx is independent variable. Indeed, you can think of the economy in a broader sense across the scope of history as being just that, physical needs. Um, they come first. They are a priori or before anything else. So keep that in mind that the physical needs and what they generate in terms of social arrangements, and Marx talks a little bit about the history of feudalism, uh, some other forms of, of social uh, an economic organization, those change over time. And Marx charts those as they evolve into capitalism. For Marx, the, the next stage of the evolution was communism, where the owners um, appropriated the means of production from the, uh, I mean, the workers appropriated the means of production from the owners. The second writing I want to talk and give you a few cues about uh, to help you read is the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Again, Marx goes back to economic arrangements as sort of, 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 of an independent variable. He says we proceed from an actual fact. Uh, it, essentially, the more a worker produces, okay, the more a worker produces, um, the less the worker is valued. When you work for someone else, what you make and your work itself becomes a commodity. You think about a fast food worker, right? You know, the more burgers they make, the more units they push, they don't get paid any extra. The company makes more and more money. That, that what the, what, What's produced in terms of fast food becomes more valued than the workers. Look at you can look at the case of McDonald's and see how this works. So, um, the, the, the idea here is a, to, to put this in perspective of our continuum, uh, while there are some collective non-rational aspects, the collectivity or the social arrangement really drives individual um, action, uh, individual behavior, individual motivation. Um, Marx asserts that individuals are born into societies where the forces and relations of production are already established beyond their will. <clears throat> In other words, I can't change the, the way the system is organized. I have to deal with it. I'm a part of it. I'm, I'm a component in there. Um, you know, I mean, economic relations has to do with who owns and who works are the base, again. You know, they affect this superstructure, this bigger structure. But again, um, you know, the, the idea is that individuals are born in the societies where the forces and relations of production, how, how the economies are organized, are bigger than them, beyond their will. So, what does this mean? People have, they coalesce into social classes based on interests. Each class has its own class-based interest, you know. You want to make as much money as you can if you're a worker. A person who owns something, a business, wants to make as much money as they can. For Marx, you know, as long as these are separate and as long as a worker has to sell that difference between the actual value of their labor for less than it's worth, um, there's going to be alienation on the part of the individual worker and inherent class conflicts between the workers and the people who own the means of production. These are things, these are elements to keep in mind as you read through these four uh, uh, readings of Karl Marx and as you answer the questions. Thanks a lot.